What's up guys? In this video, I'm going to talk about how I know Craig Wright is Satoshi Nakamoto. So I'm going to kind of piggyback off of Ryan X. Charles and Connor Murray, who did videos with the same title. And perhaps this is going to start a trend. So shout out to those two. Of course, they came up with the idea before I did. And Connor mentioned how Ryan influenced his. So I'll try to give my unique views on it. And, you know, they, they covered their points. But hopefully people can get value from my perspective. As those two are well-known figures within the space. As they helped me learn about Bitcoin. So I'll just try to give mine as someone who came kind of late. So for me, uh, I've stated this before on this channel, for me, his knowledge, his specific knowledge about Bitcoin and what it was supposed to do is unparalleled. And there is not even a second, close second, third, fourth, fifth, whatever. There isn't. Someone needs to find somebody who's second to him in terms of all the uni unique, novel things he said about the capabilities. So... I'm not going to get into specific examples here because he's written about these things, but I could just talk about some of, I'll just hit on some of the ones. All the opcodes, right? Because Core disabled most of them, 90% of them, but you know, we have most of them re-enabled, but a lot of them are still not even being used. But when asked, he's able to provide about reasons why they're there, specifically opver, because that, that one I've talked about where he's the only one that's able to explain why this thing exists. Right. He's actually no, alluded to it in his presentations. I don't know if anybody else that talks about it. OK. The other one that I think he is unique in talking about is mal transaction malleability. Now, th these are kind of technical things, so I won't dwell on them. But the ability to change a transaction like the solution to the script before it's broadcast to the ledger such that you don't invalidate the whole transaction. He's talked about the benefits of it where Core and a lot of other people, even in the BCH camp, insist that it must be fixed because it's a problem for some reason, right? So, again, he's novel in this aspect. Another is not that Bitcoin scales, but in terms of the potential. It's very consistent with what the creator said on the, publicly on the forums at the beginning. He's talked about how it could be everything. Now, I'm not even sure. We know that the Core folk don't believe that, right? Because they've intentionally hampered the software such that it can only be used by an elite few and you can only do X transactions a day. They don't believe it could be everything. They've just say they've ripped all the useful stuff out. So we have a stark contrast here between the folks that are claiming that they have BTC that's digital gold, blah blah blah, and the person who made the thing, in my opinion, talking about what it could be used for. Because he means everything. And who else has said that, right? The whole space is the whole crypto space is predicated on the fact that Bitcoin can't do anything. But yeah, this guy who's supposedly a fraud is saying it could be used for everything. So EDI, payments, uh, storing data, doing video, all kind of everything. Everything, right? Um, another one is the what we're seeing come out in the trial now is He's saying now, he's giving a little more details about his crazy trust, which is a decentralized autonomous corporation. And I think the way that that's implemented, per his words, is you have uh, transaction trees kind of sitting offline that can take different paths in terms of where coins get distributed. Now, some of this is I'm interpreting, but this is also something that if you look at the core wiki, they discouraged about doing this. They straight up say un chains of unconfirmed transactions are not should never be used because of transaction malleability. Yet here we have out coming out in court where Craig is saying his trust is likely implemented in this way. Right. So, again, we have a big contrast between the folks who are saying we're the real B Bitcoin and we have the person who likely created it talking about actually implementing what is possible, not just talking about it, right? Of course, we don't know the details. We might never know because, frankly, it's none of our business. All right. Uh, the other is in lock time and in sequence, right? He's talked about this payment channel negotiation, which is still, you know, uh, not implemented at all. But he's talked about it at length. And that's this is something Satoshi also wrote about in the early days. 
about negotiation between the two. And uh, he worked with Mike Hearn, who came to this conclusion on his own about how these things could be done offline and then you settle on chain, which is also something that Craig has talked about, that everything doesn't mean, need to be on chain all the time, that you can negotiate between two parties, leveraging the Bitcoin protocol and having stuff that are provably, provably spendable and unspendable at certain times, leveraging the end lock time, meaning you set some date in the future that both parties have, maybe it's tomorrow, and you negotiate, changing the transaction as you wish until you're both satisfied and you send it to the ledger. But if that time expires, that's uh, already written, pre-written with some, you know, sending some funds elsewhere that says, okay, if we can't come to a resolution, one side can just broadcast an amount that the other side has already agreed to. And then that's it because the time has elapsed, right? He's talked about all this stuff. I haven't seen, I mean, we know again here, Core implemented a opcode that basically replaces the in lock time functionality. And in his opinion, and also mine makes it worse. So again, we we see that people really don't know that these are the these are the so-called best developers in the world. Yet they are break they are doing things at a stark contrast from the person who made it says was a was possible. And uh, I said the next thing, but now the last thing is the IP to IP. Now that's something that was in the first iteration. It got ripped out because it was insecure, which might be true, but. Craig has talked about how the Bitcoin protocol had influences and uh, compatibility with IPv6. Now, that's something that's not really used yet in the Internet today. But it's very interesting that the per and Satoshi also talked about it, obviously, because he implemented it. So we again, we have Craig talking about the capabilities to support IPv6 and how the Bitcoin protocol is designed to do so. And we have Satoshi saying we are implementing IP to IP transactions. So we have a kind of a match there, right? With the creator talking about specific things that could be done and Satoshi actually doing, building the blocks to be able to do so in the future. And again, who's thinking that long term, right? It's been 13 years. We still haven't seen this, but obviously whoever made this stuff was thinking very big and considering the future implications of how the internet would develop. All right, so uh, of course the big reason. Let's get into why people say he's a fraud, and I'm gonna come full circle here. And then at the end of the video, I'm gonna give a personal story about Craig, and you know, kind of hope to demonstrate to people that you know he's he's very intelligent. Okay, so the Charlton claims are based. Th this is my opinion, right? They're purely based off from people criticizing him who do not have the same knowledge as him. So it's very ironic, right? That the folks calling him a charlatan are ones in areas that they claim to know stuff about that he's just superior in. And But I'm not going to get into details of math, law, whatever. I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about the economics because that's, that's something that society as a whole fails to grasp, right? The concept of the unseen is the biggest one in my opinion. We see the governments, we see planners, we see leaders of corporations, anyone making tokens, all this kind of stuff. All the folks who've made different cryptos, they fail to understand this concept, right? Because it's something that you can't really dominate. But you can at least open your thing up enough so that you're not subject to unforeseen, so many unforeseen consequences, right? And frankly, the solution to the Byzantine General's problem is not a technical one. It is an economic one. And it turns out that the person who made Bitcoin likely has very high knowledge of economics and understands these concepts as well as the technical, which is why they've been able to novelly solve the double spin problem. So anyone who's always t criticizing him, it's always in the technical arena, right? But they miss this economics part. The biggest example I can think of this is the selfish mining concept, right? We, we've seen, we have seen, we have still not seen this play out, even though those guys who six, seven years wrote about Bitcoin's uh, lot, uh, um, what's the word? Uh, you got vulnerable to a selfish mining attack. It's over. Pack it up. It's done because someone can do this. And they had all this math and stuff. But again, they don't account for what if some other miner moves hash power over to counter whatever they're doing, right? 
and we we saw a so-called selfish mining attack try to be executed on BSV and it failed. Now I know a lot of people say, oh, you know, they use Twitter for consensus. Oh, okay. So um, if they use Twitter for consensus, right? The, so you're telling me that all these miners, all these guys who have all this hardware and all this stuff, they um, their decision you. Those people get to tell those guys what to do. So it's like, so you see what I mean, right? It's not that Twitter is the consensus. It's that these guys, they're mad because they didn't listen to them. They didn't do what they wanted, right? But at the end of the day, the miners choose. And we know this, right? Miners chose the Ag Segwick. Miners chose to do the DAA. Miners chose to do all this stuff. So we just criticize the miners for cho not choosing the way we want. So we make up some nonsense about, oh, Twitter's consensus, blah, blah, blah. Those guys could choose. They can choose to fork the chain. They could choose to follow the uh, selfish miner, but they did it. Why? Right? So uh, that's a slight tangent. So, yeah, that's the, my thing. Anyone who crit calls him techno babble and all this nonsense is because he, he, by his own accord, is not very good at explaining things, but he also says that he does so in a Socratic method because I'll quote Stefan Matthews, who did an interview with Kurt on this. He said that if he said that Craig told him, wait, you know, 12, 11 years ago that, well, if I could just come out and tell them, they're not going to learn anything. And given the fact that he's autistic, he might be thinking, OK, he's explaining stuff when he's not doing a good job of it. And that just compounds the situation to where the other side just like, oh, this guy's full of crap. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He's a charlatan, blah, blah, blah. Right. So um, another point on that subject in his Arnhem speech, he actually alludes to this. He calls himself a pariah in the security industry because he leverages economics and the way he implements security or writes papers or whatever. And a lot of people don't like that because, I mean, honestly, we already know most people think security is a technical issue. But security is one of those things that can never be 100 percent. And we again, we see this in the crypto space with all these complex, complicated schemes to protect keys and funds. But at the end of the day, it's economic, right? If you can do a 97% solution, the chances of 3% happening are so low that it's worth, the trade-off is worth it. And that's the basis of kind of some of Craig's stuff is that, okay, you guys can technically do this stuff, but can you actually do it, right? So that's come up in a number of things in terms of Bitcoin that we've seen over the years, right? Whether it's uh, SegWit, whether it's um, scaling, whether it's uh, the ZeroSat thing, whether it's all this other weird stuff, yes, you can do it. Or uh, the um, the SegWit flaw, right? Is there a SegWit flaw? I don't know. Some people have been talking about it, but when's it gonna? When's where is it? Right? It's the one thing to talk about. Okay, maybe miners can steal these funds, but are they gonna destroy their seventy thousand dollar coin to do so? Because they would, right? So it, it's just, yeah, man. It's just that's that's kind of what I want to say about that. Um, and then uh, I handed on how, you know, you got the criticism of the miners for not choosing what people think they should do. And I think this compounds Craig being a charlatan because he won't come out and just say, give them the solution. They make up all these things. Well, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. And this is kind of the root of why they say he's not uh, Satoshi, because he won't move a coin. He won't sign. He won't tell people how his trust works. Right. So. People say, oh, he's a fraud. Because this is the biggest reason. The number one reason is because he uh, won't sign or he won't move a coin. They're like, just move a coin. Okay, um, just how does this correlate to anything else in life ever, right? You don't have someone say who they are by proving how much money they have. It's just, it's just crazy. People just know how much money they have based off the reputation they've built up over time. So it's really based off these selfish desires that people have that an individual, a man, will not do what they want him to do. So they, you know, drag him through the mud and all this stuff. All right. And, you know, based off these, some of these details, and if folks have done their research, they'll kind of see all this stuff. At this point, the burden of the proof about this needs to be on the other side. I've seen, you know, I don't, I'm not a fan of arguing online. I refuse to engage in it, but I see a lot of people that do. At this point, it's on the other side, right? These people need to explain some of the following things, right? They need to explain if, if this guy's a fraud and a liar and a scammer and all this stuff, 
13 years is a pretty long con to not cash out on something that just hit almost $70,000, right? So we got to think about that, right? This, so you're telling me this guy got doxxed, got sued. The only reason all this stuff's coming to a head is because people came at him, not the other way around, right? He's carrying out this 13-year-long con where he got character slandered for six years and is still doing, it's at the highest, it's probably at the highest it is now since it was maybe in 2016 when he did that BBC interview, which was a disaster. The payoff is a trial where he gets sued for half his money. <laughs> and the whole trial implies that he's Satoshi because he mined the coins in the first place. And the other side spent millions. Now, sure, maybe Ira sold this thing, but it doesn't matter. The fact is, that side has spent all this money over four years of this freaking lawsuit that's still not over to sue somebody who's supposedly poor and doesn't have any Bitcoins and doesn't know what he's talking about. Makes perfect sense. All right. So, yeah, at this point on the sock puppets, all the Aussie man bad people, we, we need to flip the script. They need to explain why these things haven't happened. We've seen 2010 coins move recently as the price approached 70000 very simple. Someone's cashing out. An early miner's like, oh, this thing's pumping. I'm going to finally sell, right? 50, 50 BTC, you know, that's that's a good chunk of change with three and a half million. They're like, oh, uh, yeah, I'm going to sell. <laughs> I'm gonna, it's, it, we don't need any conspiracies, any, oh, Satoshi son. <laughs> no. It's no coincidence that coins are moving as the price approaches the all-time high. These folks just need to use their brains, man. So, yeah. Um... Why the hate, right? Why, let, sorry, just going to my notes here. Why is this person hated so much? Why do the people call him a fraud? Why is this? It, in my opinion, what's starting, to come, what's starting to become clear, right? Of course, this is predicated that you believe some of the stuff that Craig is saying himself in these courts. But it, the, the biggest reason I feel is not because of any of the stuff he's done in the past, really, because that stuff's just kind of, uh, the factors added on top but he has been consistent in saying like I mentioned at the beginning Bitcoin is for everything they want Bitcoin being used by 5 billion people we know none of these coins as is are, besides BSV are capable of reaching that because of the scalability because as I've mentioned many times before all every single altcoin is under created under the assumption that Bitcoin cannot scale, which is a false assumption. Therefore, all of their hypotheses are wrecked. Right? That's that's as a mathematical concept. If your assumption is wrong, then everything you do after that falls apart, and that's what we're gonna see. And that's how the internet played out. You know, I could be wrong, right? People can come back to this video if I'm wrong, but. That's the reality, right? We already seen Bitcoin scale. It can already do way more than any of these other chains claim to do or have done in the past. And that's just the reality of the situation. So he is the one, even, even in his 2014 interview, the only one he, he's only done two interviews before he was doxxed. The one where he talked about the Turing completeness and at, uh, with Von Perling and uh, the Nick Sabo guy on that panel. And then the one where he did the interview in Australia, where he's talked about the capabilities of it. Um, he backs that. He backs that Bitcoin can be used by everybody. And I believe that is truly the reason, also coupled with the fact that he's creator, that they call him a fraud. Now, I'll explain this, right? The folks, there's, there's a quote. Uh, generally, Calvin's Twitter account doesn't come out with many gems. But one of the things he said is maybe a year or two ago was everybody calling Craig a fraud is likely a fraud themselves. Now, I don't know about everybody, but I can give you at least two hard examples that we know. First is everyone's favorite uh, social engineer. Um, I'm not going to say his name. There's, there's definite proof of out there of him operating multiple accounts, multiple sock puppets, talking to himself on the internet. That's ba it's not committing fraud in the legal sense, but that's fraudulent, right? If you're creating uh, an environment where people are talking to each other and agreeing with each other when it's not actually happening, when it's just one dude sitting in his basement just logging in in and out of different accounts, which he got caught at, he's, he's fraudulent, right? So he's the main one. He's the main one calling him. He's the main one, and all, he's likely the same person as you know all these 15 other people that are doing it. 
That's that's fraudulent behavior. Yeah, he's calling Craig a fraud. The second person is uh, the Monero maintainer, Ricardo, whatever his last name is. He actually got arrested for fraud. This dude was literally changing uh, vendor invoices and p getting him routing money back to himself for work that wasn't done and all this crazy stuff. He actually got arrested for fraud. I mean, you can't write this stuff, man. It's just crazy. And he was one of the big voices, too, against Craig. So, again, let me, uh, I'll just, I know I've ranted here and, you know, uh, rambled on. I'm going to bring this full circle. It is, I think it's quite probable that the only reason people call Craig a fraud is because he actually is Satoshi. Now, let me explain that. Craig has hinted about how the ATO during that whole battle, they went approached Blockstream to find out about what Craig has been doing to get more intel on him, right? And we know Craig was hacked multiple times, and we know documents were changed and forged. We don't know that all of them were, but we're we're seeing that in court as as I'm recording this. That's one of the things that came up yesterday was you know stuff getting changed and altered. It, it's very believable that they did that so that. They could call him a fraud in the future. So this whole thing, because they knew he's Satoshi, right? They all reacted in lockstep. Just look at what happened, right? When Gavin came out and said that he's Satoshi, they're like, oh, Gavin, you're hacked. You're, you're out. You're, we're kicking you out, man. You, you, I don't know what's going on with you, but you're out. Just, you know, it's almost like it was almost like a, a button was pressed and these guys just went into defense damage control mode and what they did the the other part in that playbook was character assassination which is the same thing that they're doing in the courts right now there's very little evidence if you guys have seen that Lori you know video he's he's talking about how there's just not enough evidence to number one even call this person a fraud number two to even prove a partnership right so this very possible based off the stuff we've seen because you know, before 2015, nobody knew who this guy was. And then suddenly when he gets doxxed, it, it just turns out, okay, now all this negative stuff comes out. And then it comes out that the documents were changed and he claims the ownership for all these addresses. And it's very convenient that the people saying that he is a fraud, they're very detailed in how he's a fraud. Is it possible because they're the ones who made that narrative up themselves? They're the ones who changed the documents in a way. Let me give you an example. One of the documents which we know is forged is there's one that lists five addresses. Three of those addresses belong to other people. Roger Ver, this is the 16 COU address. 1933 belongs to the John Doe in the trial. And then um, there's the one FX address, which actually Craig has now said he's purchased. Um, and from that whole Mount Gox debacle, which I'm not going to get into. So on this doc, those addresses are changed to those. But Craig has a picture that he took of the same document where the addresses are completely different. So we know someone made a altered version and they put those addresses in there. And the favorite social engineer has been running around on socials saying the same thing. This guy just, he, he's such a con man. He just changed the addresses to the top rich list ones. How does he know that, right? How does he know? Even even if he's saying that, it's conjecture, right? If you were trying to alter documents, wouldn't it be smarter to just pick five random other addresses, right, of just random coin bases? Why would you choose from the list, rich list? That's a narrative he made up on his own. He likely said, oh, well, if I was trying to make Satoshi, this guy out to be a fraud, I would probably just go and pick the rich list addresses and put them on a document and say they're mine. That's, that's more probable than lying and saying I own these addresses that someone that uh, very public figures actually own, like Roger, right? That makes more sense. It's just, it's just crazy, man. This whole thing is crazy. Okay, so yeah, it could be that this whole f Craig Wright is a fraud was completely made up because he's actually Satoshi. Because they want to prevent Bitcoin scaling, they want to keep their pet rock altcoin digital gold nonsense going up uh, 80,000, 90,000, whatever. They want, because they, they know as soon as he comes back, the party's over. And that's why I think we're seeing this last ditch effort to grasp at straws. And, and we're already seeing them change the narrative. The same guys like, oh, there's no proof. There's no proof. 
Uh, Satoshi, mine the early blocks. Okay, okay, makes total sense. <laughs> and then Lop, uh, the LN shill, that guy's like, he, he said this three three or four years ago. He's like, oh, um, yeah, he was probably involved. He's still a liar and a fraud. And then, you know, there's no critical thinking, right? What does lying and being a fraud have to do with creating Bitcoin? Nothing, right? Um, that, that email that was talked about yesterday that was forged in the court documents about um, him forging a PGP or whatever. Honestly, committing that sort of thing has nothing to do with creating software or having the capabilities. So it's just people are making up stuff that have nothing to do with the knowledge or the ability or the vision to create something that could be that could change the nature of where we're going on this on earth to um, scale to five billion people, yet but yet maybe ra randomly altered and uh, lied about certain things. They have nothing to do with each other. Nothing. Just because just because you're talented doesn't mean you're not a liar, right? And we've seen that all over the place. Okay, uh, this this is gone. Ranty's gone long enough. So I'll just end this with a personal story. So I had a meeting with a few people in May 2019. This was right before the CoinGeek conference about EDI on blockchain. At the time, I was still working with my employer. And the big concern when I was p pushing some of this stuff internally was that, oh, well, why would we want to put orders, you know, orders between companies, sales orders or purchase agreements, whatever, between two companies on a public immutable ledger, right? That's, that's a big concern. A lot of these companies don't want they're just their data just sitting out there that's easily accessible by people. And even the encryption part is dubious because, you know, there's all these other laws and people are not sure how it's implemented. So that was the subject of the meeting. And I'm not going to say who else was in the meeting, but Craig happened to be there, right? He was in the meeting. And the whole time he was playing around on his phone, doing all this other stuff, getting pictures taken of him. He still had Twitter at the time. And I'm thinking, okay, you know, yeah, that's fine because he wasn't... I didn't come to have this meeting with him. He just was in the room. So I'm talking about all this stuff with the other people. At, so I, like I mentioned, at the, I didn't think he was paying attention at all. I just thought he was doing his own thing. At the very end of the meeting, he comes over. He has a sheet of paper where he's written out diagrams and uh, movement of transactions. And he's walking me through about how you could do different encryption schemes on different pieces of data such that all the participants know what's happening in the orders, but yet it's completely private to any outside third-party person who was not involved in that transaction. They don't know what was going on, but the people involved do. I wish, I do regret not taking that piece of paper with me, but in this meeting, you know, I was expressing my concerns to the other side about, you know, how can I take this back, some of this knowledge back and communicate and ease the uh, concerns about doing this type of stuff on Bitcoin. And the person who I thought was playing around on social and tweeting and taking pictures for whatever, it turns out he was paying attention the whole time and probably added more value at the very end than the entire uh, previous hour did. Um, so that's that's just a story I wanted to say about him. That just shows that he 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 is a special person who is very smart. And again, that 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 little diagram thing. I mean, that's kind of how the white paper is written, right? Where it talks about how participants can engage in commerce where a person outside, if they're transacting privately, they have no idea what's happening while it's still legally compliant or whatever. All right, so I hope I didn't like, you know, I bounced around or whatever, but I hope that kind of gave my unique perspective on why so. We're going to see all this stuff come out. We're starting to see folks lose their minds and starting to come to grips with reality here. I don't know if there's going to be any big reveal or whatever, or if there's going to be some big thing, but this is likely the start of a changing of a narrative. So I'm excited to see this stuff play out over the next few weeks. I'm, I'm you know, in case the dates get screwed, whatever. I'm recording this November 16th, so right in the middle of the trial. So I'm looking forward to what comes out. I hope folks learn something for this, and I'll see you guys in the next one.